Welcome to our fourth and final lesson in our Introduction to Material Structure course. Today, we'll be focusing on composite materials, specifically how our reinforcement, matrix, and interface of our composite influence its structure and properties. Now, when talking about composites, we're interested in multiple length scales. We can think about this in a tree diagram, shown here. First, we have our constituents. This is what our composite is made out of. This is our microstructure. A little bit larger, but still on the microstructure length scale, we have how our constituents are arranged in our composite, such as particle reinforced and fiber reinforced. Finally, we move on to the macroscopic scale. This are more structural elements of our composite, such as laminates and sandwich panels. We'll be talking about each of these levels in this course today. Let's start with our constituents. Our definition of composites is a material consisting of two or more dissimilar materials. We will use this generic fiber reinforced composite as an example. My reinforcements are these discrete fibers. My matrix material is the continuous phase holding my reinforcement in place. Often, this is some kind of epoxy resin or other polymer system. Now, the matrix and reinforcement often have very different properties. This is done on purpose, as the properties of my composite as a whole are a combination of my components. We can take advantage of the best properties of both and tailor our material to a degree. But one area of a composite to highlight is the interface between my reinforcement and my matrix. Here, I'm trying to bond two dissimilar materials together. This can be quite challenging, so we need to pay attention to our interface. It can be a location for material failure, and understanding this interfacial region so we can make it more resistant to fracture, is still an area of ongoing research. So, we have our constituents. Now we need to talk about how we arrange these constituents in our composite. We have two general categories for this, fiber reinforced and particle reinforced. Particle reinforced composites have, as you may have guessed, particles as their reinforcement. An example of this you'll be familiar with is concrete. My matrix is cement, and my reinforcement varies, sand to gravel. If I have an even distribution of my reinforcement, so my sand or gravel, I will end up with a fairly isotropic or uniform properties in my concrete. Reinforced concrete, on the other hand, has two kinds of reinforcements, my sand and gravel as before, and some additional rebar or mesh. The addition of the rebar or mesh adds a highly anisotropic or uneven property component to my composite material on purpose to give me additional structures, structural stability for construction applications. Next, we move on to fiber reinforced composites. Here, we have two types of fibers, continuous and discontinuous. For my continuous fibers, I'm dealing with a highly anisotropic system. For my discontinuous fibers, I have a couple options. I can either try to orientate my short fibers along some axis of interest within my composite, again giving me a highly anisotropic system, or I can randomly align them, giving me a relatively isotropic material. So we have our constituents, and we now know how they're arranged on the microstructure level. But composites, unlike some other material families, have varying structures at the macroscopic level. Now, some, like our particle reinforced composite in our concrete, exist the same as the microstructure and the macrostructure. But for our continuous and aligned discontinuous fiber reinforced composites, we have some more complex structures. We can define one sheet of our composite as a lamina. Here, we lay up our lamina in a specific arrangement depending on the properties I want from my bulk composite. This is called a laminate. For example, I could align all of my fibers in the same direction for each lamina. I will have a highly anisotropic composite where I will align my fibers along the highest loading direction within my product. Or I could rotate my lamina by some angle to get a more isotropic laminate composite, at least in this direction. We can also make sandwich panels. Similar to an I-beam, 
These are designed to have most of our material weight away from the center line, providing us with a stiff structure, which is resistant to bending. Sandwich panels can be used in different situations than I-beams, allowing us flexibility in our design. The cross section of a sandwich panel is shown here. We have our composite laminate, which makes up the faces of our panel. Inside, we have our core. This is often some lightweight material that is a high resistant to shear forces. For example, I might have some facing sheet of composite with an inner core of honeycomb, providing a very rigid, lightweight structure. Both my laminate and my sandwich panel allow different design choices for my macro structure of my composite. And with that, we've finished our discussion about composites and our discussion about material structure. Again, there is so much more to this topic because we can alter our structure of our material through various processing techniques, which impacts our properties and ultimately the performance of our material. But we've laid the foundations. We've talked about atomic bonds and categorized them based on general features. We've discovered the difference between crystalline and amorphous materials based on atomic arrangement and defined when a unit cell is in a crystalline material. We've identified the basic components of polymeric chains. And finally, we've talked about the influence that reinforcement matrix and interface can have on the structure and properties of composites. My name is Dr. Caitlin Tyler, and thanks for joining me today.